Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. Our mission is to glorify God and to make disciples by bringing the gospel into all of life in all the earth. This is Chris Kipp, lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And if you've not joined us in a worship gathering or at a house church yet, we would love to have you join us. You can find out more information at rin-church.org. And I pray that you are encouraged and edified by the proclamation of God's word today. We are in a series right now called The Awe of God. We are kind of following a... um, a book written by John Bevere. It's a six week long devotional. Okay, this has got uh, chapters that are about three to five minutes long to read. We have a few copies in the back. We're about halfway done. So if you want to just jump in and catch up, you can. But this has been a great series, and it's all about the fear of God, the fear of God. It is, uh, it's a theme that we see throughout the scriptures, and it is so important. And if you've been following along in the book, the last couple uh, sessions of, of week three, John Bevere tells a story of meeting a prominent televangelist. He, uh, he was a man that kind of lives in infamy. His name is Jim Baker. Some of you might recall Jim Baker. Apparently in the 80s, I was just, so just so you know, I was barely conscious of things in the world in the 80s, okay? I was just a wee little one in the 80s. I am a child of the 80s. I grew up in the 80s, okay? Do we have any other people who grew up in the 80s? Just a few of you. Yes, yes, yes. That's so wonderful. We, uh, we, we listed off all the generations for our children last night at the, at the table, and I am Gen X. Do we have any Gen Xers? Yeah, a few Gen Xers? No, no, no Gen Xers. Thank you. We got one in the back, Jason. Yeah. Apparently, my wife is a millennial, and I knew there was something wrong this whole time, and I was like, it's because she's a millennial. <laughs> Just kidding. She's, she's serving kids' ministry, so I can say all kinds of stuff right now. I'm, I'm safe. As long as you don't say anything to her after the service, no. Um, so in the 80s, Jim Baker is this prominent televangelist, um, you know, a, a massive following. And uh, if you know anything about his life, it ended in scandal. He had an affair. He had uh, committed mail fraud in his ministry. And CNN televised his trial. So literally was, you know, skewered in the media throughout this terrible downfall. And so John Bevere writes a book in his probably late 20s, early 30s, his very, very first book. Jim Baker gets a copy of this book in prison. And it radically changes his life. It touches his heart. And he calls. He has his assistant. Jim Baker has an assistant still while he's in prison. I don't know how that works, okay? And he has his assistant call John's assistant and says, please have John come and talk with me. Now, you can imagine John Bevere is probably like, uh, what and why? And, and he's very, very guarded but he decides to go, and he has lots of questions for Jim about his life. And so he meets Jim in, in prison. Jim hugs him and just a big embrace, and he says, we only have 90 minutes, and I have so much to tell you. And Jim Baker begins to tell John how God delivered him of evil in his first year in prison, how he found a Bible study and they would just read scripture and they would pray and they would talk together for hours about, about the Lord. And John said, you're, you're, you, you're leading the Bible study, right? He said, no, 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 no. He said, I was a master manipulator. I cannot lead something like that again. I can't do it. And as he's sharing more and more about how God had changed his life. John kind of has this question that's been burning in his heart and he feels like, okay, maybe it's okay to ask the question. And so he asked Jim, at what point did you stop loving Jesus? Right? You, 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 you totally blew up your life. You, you did all this evil. Like, at what point did you stop loving Jesus? And Jim, with the most earnest, serious look in his, 
uh, eyes, he grabs his arm and he says, I never stopped loving Jesus. I didn't fear him. And he said, John, there are millions of Americans just like me. They love Jesus, but they don't fear him. I, I want you to imagine that I had a like, beautiful coin in front of you. I don't, I just have my hands, but just use your imagination, okay? This is a, a, an exercise. So on one side of the coin, it's an image of a lamb, the lamb of God. It's beautiful, right? Maybe the lamb has this kind of sash around its neck, a, a scarlet sash. And in the most beautiful lettering, it says on the edge of the coin, gracious love, gracious love. But then on the other side of the coin, okay, just imagine you see something completely different. You, you see something closer to what is described in Revelation chapter 19, where it says there is a, one on a white horse whose name is Faithful and True. In his eyes, they burn like fire. There are many crowns upon his head. His robe is dipped in blood. He has trampled the winepress of God's wrath. And on this one, it says this. It says, consuming fire. Jim Baker was living a double life, right? Preaching Jesus, living in sin. And let's be honest, it's super easy for us to live a double life. It's really easy. And here's how you do it. You have a single-sided coin. If you have a single-sided image of Jesus, you will live a double life. It is only when we have a double-sided image of Jesus that we can live the kind of life that we just sang about where it's literally, I give you my all. We can have a single-minded devotion to Jesus when we have a double-sided understanding of who he is. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Okay. And so today, what I want us to do is look at Isaiah chapter 66. 66. If you have a copy of scripture, go there with me. And I want you to remember that it's the same coin. It's the same coin. Um, we have... Um, a lot of opinions out there about parenting these days, right? And uh, many of you have read all the books about parenting and maybe it worked for you. Maybe you're like, the books did not work for my children, okay? Like, I, I don't know what your story is, but one of the um, approaches is what they would call like more grace-based parenting or needs-based parenting. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. And it, it would be the idea that like, if your kid's acting up, it's because they have a need that's unmet, right? Or a, a grace base is that you're just going to show them grace. And here's the thing about grace is you will never understand grace until you understand judgment, right? Your, your child cannot understand the fact that you could have punished them, but you did not because you were gracious because they never knew what a punishment was anyways. Does that make sense? You're robbing them of grace if you don't teach them about judgment, Right? And so we have to have a double-sided understanding of who the Lord is. Isaiah, a prophet who was in the 8th century BC, he is a, a prolific prophet. Obviously, we are, we're on chapter 66, the last chapter of the book. He, has, he speaks of the future, but he often speaks in the future. And in, 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 in that I'm saying he speaks as though these things have already happened. Okay, but he's talking about events that are so far out in the future. And in the midst of that, he gives us this just sort of picture and this word from God. And this is what it says in verse one of Isaiah 66. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where could you possibly build a house for me? Wow. You, you want to build me a temple? Great. I will not fit in that temple. Right? And where would my resting place 
B, my hand made all these things, and so they all came into being. This is the Lord's declaration. What house are you going to build for me? And then he says this, I will look favorably on this kind of person, one who is humble, submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. One person slaughters an ox, another kills a person. One person sacrifices a lamb, another breaks a dog's neck. One person offers a grain offering, another offers pig's blood. One person offers incense, another praises an idol. All these have chosen their ways and delight in their, get this, abhorrent practices. So I will choose their punishment and I will bring on them what they dread because I called and no one answered. I spoke and they did not listen. They did what was evil in my sight and chose what I did not delight in. Wow. So here we have this this word of of the Lord from Isaiah, and he's speaking uh, about these future events. And he first says, look, there's no human structure that can contain this infinite creator God. Just doesn't happen. Doesn't work that way. And then in verse two, he gives us this, um, this sort of, this, this word about who he will look favorably on. And it's almost like a job description, right? If you've ever looked for a job and you looked at like what they were looking for in the job and you're trying to figure out like, do I have the skills that I need to be the kind of person for this job? And he's telling us, look, here's the job description of the person that I will look favorably on. This is what they're like. These are the things that I'm looking for. And he just tells us what they are. And by the way, that, that, that term to look favorably on, it means to pay attention to or to look intently at. That God, the infinite God who just told us that everything exists because of his word, he made everything, that he would look intently with favorable attention upon this kind of person. And he gives us three things, three qualifiers. Wanted, humble, humble. That word, is also translated as poor, lowly, and weak. Poor, lowly, and weak. It, it reminds us of the words of Jesus where he says, blessed, happy are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. He's looking for humble people. The second thing is he says submissive in spirit. And that word literally means to be crippled or to be lame. Like you are, you're broken down. You are submissive in your spirit. There's a lowliness about you, right? And we see this in Psalm 51 after David's big fiasco with Bathsheba and then Nathan confronts him. And he says this, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and contrite heart. Submissive in spirit. And the third thing, and this is where I want us to camp out today, is that he says that he's looking for those who tremble at his word, to tremble at his word. And guess what that means? Fearful, reverential awe. He's looking for people who have an awe of God, who have a fear of him, and it's a specific kind of fear that trembles at his word. Trembles at his word. And this morning, I want us to talk about what does it mean for us to tremble at his word. Before we do that, I just want to point out something in verse 3 of what we just read. He gives some of these examples that one person slaughters an ox, right? Another person kills somebody. And, and, and the, the, the way that that can be translated, and depending on what translation you have, it could be uh, translated also as, is as if, 
So he who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog neck. So it's this picture of doing holy actions could be this very same as doing these abhorrent profane actions. And then he says that both of them, all of them have chosen their, their abhorrent ways. And the point that he's making is this, that our, ho- our holy actions are actually the very same as our profane actions if we lack the trembling at the word of God. We lack the fear of the Lord, right? Because we don't tremble. And then he gives us just some clarity about what does it mean to tremble. In verse four, here's what he said. Because I called and no one answered. I spoke and they did not listen. They did what was evil in my sight and chose what I did not delight in. So he's saying in the negative, like, what does it mean to tremble at, at, the, uh, at, at the word of God? And, and the, the opposite of that is that we don't listen, that we do what is evil, and we choose what God does not delight in. And so if we were just to make that positive, it, it would be this, that we listen when he speaks, that we do what is good in his sight, and we choose what he delights in. That's what it means for us to tremble at God's word. To put it very, very simply, and this is the first point, it's this. To tremble at God's word is to obey him. That's it. To tremble at his word is to obey him. And by the way, did you know that you were chosen by God's foreknowledge, by the sanctifying work of his spirit, to be obedient to him. In 1 Peter 1, verse 1 and 2, that's exactly what he tells us, that God chose you from the foundation of the world. And one of the things that he had planned for you is that you would be obedient to him. So guess what? God's will for you is that you would become more and more and more obedient to him. So just give in, right? It's like if you're standing in a river and the current's going one way and you're just trying so hard to go the other direction, the current of the Holy Spirit in your life is leading you in the direction of becoming more and more obedient to the Father, to tremble at his word. It's his will for you. But... Our man, Charles Spurgeon, said this in his book, Being God's Friend. He said, faith is the fountain, the fountain and fosterer of obedience. Men do not obey God until they believe him. Faith is the morning star of obedience. So I want to give you four faith foundations that help us obey God. Like if you don't believe these things, you're going to really struggle with obeying God. Okay? Here they are. Four things. God knows what is right for me. Do you believe that? That your father in heaven, he knows exactly what is right for you. The second thing, God is pure love and he loves me. That his commands are not just like some dictator barking out commands to just random people. It's like, no, no. He has a very specific love for his people, for his children, and he speaks from love. And every command is laced with love. The third thing, everything God tells me to do is ultimately for my good. Wow. I think we have lots of stories of, of how we've learned that the hard way, don't we? <laughs> Ultimately for my good. And the fourth thing, no matter what he says, I choose to obey him. No matter what it is, I choose to obey him because I believe that he knows what's right for me, that he's pure love and he loves me, and everything he tells me to do is ultimately for my good. You got it? Got it? So they're foundations. Now, 
if, if trembling at God's word is to obey him, then what does this obedience look like? Like, what does this look like for us to tremble at his word? And I want, I want to talk about five manifestations of trembling at God's word. To, a, 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 a manifestation is just something that was hidden is now suddenly made known. Okay? So five manifestations of trembling at God's word. The first one is this. If I am going to be a person who trembles at God's word, then that means I will obey God immediately. Oh, that's hard to do. Amen? Any kids in the room? They all went to kids ministry because they probably, the Lord was like, get them out of the room before Chris talks about this. Obey God immediately. How many times, parents, have you said, do this, child, do this, and you look in their room 30 minutes later and you're like, what's going on? I said to do that, right? Oh, well, you know, blah, 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 right? And, and, and here's the thing is we are the same way as adults. It is so hard for us to obey God immediately. There's a story from the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 9, and um, Jesus is calling disciples. In fact, what he's going to do in just a minute is he's going to take these 70 disciples, and he's going to commission them out, and they're going to go do the things of Jesus. So he's calling these disciples, and it says to one, he says, follow me, but this guy says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now, we hear that, and we're like... Dude's dad died. Like, let him go bury his father. And Jesus says to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And we're like, wow, Jesus. Like, we disrespect our families? Like, what does that mean? Well, in the context, when, when you were the firstborn son and your father passed away and you went through the ceremony of, of, of burying your father, what that meant for you was a double portion inheritance, which means that this guy, and Jesus knows, this guy has money on the mind. And what he says, in effect, is let me go make some money and get things like in, a good sh- in good shape, and then I'll come follow you. And Jesus says to him, no, that's not how it works. Let the dead bury their own dead, but you come follow me. There's another guy in the story, and he says, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to my family at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. What? Those are harsh words, Jesus. He just wants to go tell his mom and dad bye. Like, what, what is going on here, right? Why, why would he say that? What, in the context... What we, what we see is that what this man was saying is, let me go make sure that everyone else is cool with this first. I'm going to go talk to my dad and my mom and my brother and my sister and my uncles and my cousin, my grandparents. Let's get everybody together. We'll have a family meeting. I'll say, Jesus said to follow him. What do you guys think about that? And they're all going to say, oh, no, that guy's kind of crazy. People are saying weird stuff about him. And he's like, you know, maybe he's demon passive demon-possessed, we, we don't know, right? So th- there's all this stuff around the scenario, and he's basically saying, let me check in with everyone else first before I follow you. And I heard a pastor say this, an idol is any person or thing that you have to check in with before you obey God. Wow. And so Jesus says, look, it doesn't work that way. If you're gonna if you're gonna try to put your hand to the plow and just look back and say, Y'all good with this? Me following Jesus thing? Right? And the point that Jesus is making is this. When I'm calling, I want you to answer and I want you to answer immediately. Like, come and follow me. Obey me immediately. Come. The invitation is now. Let's go. Obey me. It's the first thing. Second thing is this, obey 
even when it doesn't make sense. If I'm going to be a person who trembles at God's word, then that means that I will obey even when it doesn't make sense. Has God ever called you to do something that does not make sense to you? Right? Yeah? God told me to plant a church. That was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of, right? Planting a church. That's a bad idea. There's lots of churches out there. I could just go work at a church. And God says, plant a church. And it doesn't make sense when God tells us to do things. And yet, we just have to make a step. And um, the, I, I think about these, these stories from the life of Jesus. Like, does it make sense for Jesus to spit into mud and to make this, like, nasty paste Put it on some guy's eye and say, go wash in the pool of Siloam and then go sh show yourself to the priest and you'll be healed. And the man does it. Now, does that make sense? No, that makes zero sense to me. But the man did it and the man's eyes see again. Does it make sense for Jesus at a party, a wedding party where they're running out of wine and his mom says come on, like, we have no other options. Jesus, like, come and do your thing. Come, you know, show, show some of your wondrous powers here. And he says to the servants, you know, fill up these four big, you know, vessels with water. And it's like, we need wine, Jesus. He says, no, fill them up with water. Doesn't make sense. And yet they did. And they had the finest wine at that wedding party. Does it make sense for Jesus to tell Peter to put out into deeper water and cast their nets one more time when they have been fishing all night long and they have nothing to show for it? And Peter says, mm, Lord, we've got nothing all night long, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And they pulled in a haul of fish so large that their nets were breaking. It doesn't make sense. And yet we, if we're going to be people who tremble at his word, we need to obey him even when in our brains, this makes zero sense, Jesus. The third thing, if I'm going to be a person who trembles at God's word, then that means that I will obey even when I don't see a personal benefit. Whoa, yeah, that's convicting. How often do we look for the benefit first? I mean, we live in a culture full of marketing and advertising and just the era of consumerism, which is basically like, show me the, the, the benefit. Show me why I should buy this. Show me why I should go here. Show me why I should do this. Show me the benefit. And we cannot be naive enough to think that that does not creep into our minds when we walk into the church with other believers and we're always thinking, what's in this for me today? What's, what's my feeling about this church and the music and the preaching and, and the you know, facility, the... Schoolhouse of the Lord, as Jason called it, right? What's the benefit for us? And Jesus says we're to obey even when we don't see a personal benefit. I mean, I, I think about the stories of the scripture and was Abraham thinking of his own benefit when God says, I want you to march your son Isaac up the mountain and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And you, you know the story, Abraham makes Isaac carry all the stuff up there. That's not cool, right? You're going to sacrifice your son? Hey, can you carry all the wood and stuff? Cool. He walks him up there, builds the, 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 the altar and the fire, right? And he, he literally ties up Isaac, and he's about to do it, and the angel says, stop! You passed the test, bro. And there's a ram stuck in the thicket. And the angel says this to Abraham, he says, now I know that you, get this, fear the Lord. Was Esther thinking of, of her own benefit 
when she risked her life going before a king when she was not summoned, right? And she's going to stop this wicked anti-Semitic plan of Haman, and yet she becomes this instrument of the Lord's deliverance for his people, see, all throughout the scriptures, we're surrounded with these examples of people who obeyed when there was no personal benefit in sight. And here's what the scripture says. We walk by faith and not by sight. Meaning that many times we cannot see a benefit from obeying God. And yet in that moment, more than ever, we need to know that I walk by faith and not by sight. And I know by faith, he knows what's best for me. Everything he tells me to do is for my benefit. He loves me. And no matter what, I'm gonna choose to obey him. By faith. The fourth thing, Right? If I'm going to be a person who trembles at God's word, then that means that I will obey even when it's painful. Oh, these, each point is just getting a little bit harder, right? Even when it's painful. What greater example do we have of this than Jesus? You know? Philippians 2 verse 8 says that he humbled himself by becoming obedient, that's our word, to the point of death. Even to death on a cross. First Peter 2, 21, he's talking to Christians and he's talking about the sufferings that are going on. And here's what he tells them. For you were called to this. Called to what? Called to live an abundant life. Called to drive a Mercedes Benz and live in a sweet house and call to what, Peter? Call to suffering. There's gonna be suffering, right? By the way, if you drive a Mercedes and live in a nice house, I, there's no, <laughs> God bless you, that, that, I, that's fine, okay? You know, and I know, that that does not preclude you from the real suffering that comes from following Jesus, Okay? It says, for you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, okay, that you should follow in his steps. I'm willing to suffer for Jesus because I want to obey him. First Peter 4, he continues on, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same attitude. Wow. Because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. We have Jesus showing us our example that we obey even when it's painful. The last one, if I'm going to be a person who trembles at God's word, that means that I will obey to completion. We talked about this last week. Uh, Saul and the Amalekites, and God says, I want you to wipe them out completely. And Saul does 98% of what God says to do, right? It's like almost 100%. Most everything was wiped out. They saved some choice animals, and they saved the king, right? And we, know, we, we read that Saul was afraid of the people, so he didn't want to go all the way with the whole following God thing. So he just went 98% in we see that the kingdom was stripped away from him. And he says, I found a man after my own heart. And the point is that he wants us to obey 100%. If we're gonna tremble at God's word, then we need to obey 100%. So let's just kind of recap what we just said. These five manifestations is this, that we obey God immediately. We obey even when it doesn't make sense. We obey even when, I, when we don't see a personal benefit. We obey when it's painful. We obey to completion. And if you're anything like me, you read a list like that and you're like, ah, failed, right? 
I don't think I even got a D on I think I got an F on that. Like I, I'm fairly certain that I have violated every single one of those at some point in my life of following Jesus. Amen? Right? All of us have. We've fallen so short. And when we read a list like this, we probably fall into two camps. In fact, it, it, uh, there's a quote by Tertullian. It's one that I quote quite a bit. And here's what he said, that just as, um, just as Christ was crucified between two thieves, so this doctrine of justification is ever crucified between two opposite errors. And if you know what he's talking about, he's talking about this. There's two errors, and you have the, the way of the cross, right? And on one side, you have the ditch of legalism. And if you're a legalist, you hear that list of, of, of the five manifestations, and you're like, let's get to work, baby. Come on. Let's get, you know, get the list out, okay? And I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to follow these rules. I'm going to obey to completion. I'm going to obey when it's painful. I'm, you know, we, we go through the list. And, and the thing about legalism is that legalism does not mean doing good works, okay? It does not mean that. It means earning our salvation by doing good works. Do you see the difference? All throughout the New Testament, we're called to do good works, but we do it not because we're trying to earn something from God, but because of what Jesus has already done for us. The other side is lawlessness or license, lawlessness. When you're the other kind of person, you hear the five manifestations and you're like, I have not done that. I don't know if I ever will fully complete that list. Therefore, God's gracious and what's it matter? Anyway, he's going to forgive us at the end, so let's just do what we want to do. And we throw out God's commands completely. We disregard them. And the legalist, they see consuming fire. And the lawless person sees gracious love. And in Isaiah 66, verse 3, it says this. All these have chosen their ways and delight in their abhorrent practices. And if you're a legalist, you will never truly obey God. You can't. And if you're a lawless person, you will never truly obey God. You're incapable it is only, and this is what Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. Because the legalist and the lawless both need the cross of Jesus Christ. Because in the cross, we see the consuming fire wrath of God meet the gracious love of God in the same act perfect holiness on display and perfect love and grace in the same moment. The cross is the place where we realize that my sinful condition is so terrifyingly bad that Jesus had to die. And God's love for me was so strong that Jesus did die. Consuming fire and gracious love. And it's only when we understand this that something happens on the inside of us and begins to change us and we begin to look more and more like Jesus in our obedience. So I just want to end with one verse. I'm going to point us to this last verse. This is where we'll end today. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purposes. There's a lot we can say about that. 
Paul is talking to Christians that he had been with in person and they were on their best behavior when they were with Paul. Paul's leaving now and he's like, hey, now that I'm absent, please continue to obey. Now, have you ever had a mountaintop experience with God where you're just like, he is so close to you, right? You have this sense of the nearness of the presence of God. And then as we kind of sang about with you give and you take away, right? You, you have high points, you have low points, you go through a low point in your life and you're like, where are you, God? And in both places, you know, like he'll never leave me or forsake me. But in one place, you could feel like he will never leave me or forsake me. He's right here. He's with me. Awesome. Yeah. And then the other side, you're like, the Bible said he would never leave me or forsake me. But like, like, I, I don't know like what that means right now because I do not feel it. And the only way that you and I can live out this obedient life in the ups and the downs and the highs and the lows is this, we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, with awe and reverence, trembling at the word of God. And that phrase work out means this, it's a process. It's a process. When you look at the five manifestations, you're like, eh, guess what? Don't exit the process. Don't exit The process, God loves you so much. He's not giving up on you. If you've fallen short, guess what? His grace is for you, his gracious love for you, and he does not want you to exit the process because you've fallen short. Get back on the horse, amen? Don't exit the process. Work it out from grace to grace and glory to glory. Don't exit the process. And then he says this, God is working in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And here's the thing, obedience isn't what you do for God. Hear me say that. Obedience isn't what you do for God. It's what God is doing inside of you. Let him change you. Let the the spirit of God that comes into your life, not because of your righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus that declares you holy before a holy, consuming fire, let that very spirit work in you, changing you, bringing forth a heart that delights in obeying God's word, to tremble at his word. Don't exit the process. He's working inside of you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Renaissance Church Sermon Podcast. To support our work, you can like, share, subscribe, or you can donate at rin-church.org.